If you're stuck in your weight loss plateau and your body won't change, the fat won't budge, your insomnia never resolves no matter what you do, your chronic illness seems to linger no matter what diet or nutrition protocol or coach that you try, then you're going to want to pay attention to this class because this is something that it's hard for a lot of people to grasp, but if you do, you're going to see more results than all of the different diets that you've tried, all of the different foods that you've restricted, and so forth. The truth is your body is not complicated, and what you're going through is not a very complicated, complex thing. Not that I'm minimizing whatever it is, whether it's Hashimoto's or lupus or just stagnant 20 pounds that won't move, but the world and all its 30-something year olds on YouTube that tell you what works for them and why it should work for you, that's what's making it complicated. The diet confusion, the fear that people are putting in you around, you know, you, can, you should eat this and you shouldn't eat that and you should do this and you shouldn't do that. And that's why when I work with someone, I work on a bio-individual level because what works for one person isn't going to work for another. And I want to see what your body needs and what your symptoms are telling me that you need. And you want to remember that you are not a cookie cutter. You're not like everyone else. And these people that have tried something for six months and then put a whole YouTube channel out about why everybody should be keto, they're missing the boat because it's going to work for six months for sure. But let's talk to those people in about three years and see how they're feeling. So bottom line is it's not about the food. It's not about the exercise. It's really about what are your constant thoughts and symptoms related to your illness telling you and when did they start okay so before we get jumped into this topic as always if you guys have questions as I'm going through this please post them and I'm happy to answer but I want to talk first about cutting like your a cut that you get on your body so let's say that you're working on something you slice your arm what do we do when that happens well we usually clean it up put a band-aid on it and let it heal right we believe that our body can heal that cut, right? So we look at that cut and we go, okay, well, it's gonna form a scab. It's gonna have some red inflammation for a while, but then it's gonna get better. And I might have a little scar from it, but that's all. And we believe that, right? Same with a broken bone. We go to the doctor, the doctor's like, listen, all I can do is really put it in place and the bone's gonna heal back together. Our body is designed to heal, okay? If we get out of the way, our body is designed to heal. And that doesn't just have to go for cuts and broken bones. It actually can go for a lot of the different issues that you're dealing with. But a lot of times, because of the diet confusion, because of all of the this, that, and the other, and the limiting beliefs that we have, we stay stuck in our symptoms because we believe that we haven't found the answer yet, or this, this isn't working, so that's not gonna work. And we're gonna go into all that. So just remember that your body is designed to heal if we give it the proper conditions. And sometimes it has nothing to do with food or exercise. I mean, imagine how great it would be if you can heal your lupus or your Hashimoto's or your fibromyalgia, and you don't have to change your diet. You actually have to change your mindset, okay? So this is, this is what I'm trying to get to is like, this is going to be heavy. This is going to take some thinking. So make sure when you're watching this class that you're doing so really tuning in and really listening because you can't just be doing stuff in the background and expect to absorb this. This is heavy stuff. When the body's trying to heal and it gets a message of a threat, okay, this becomes a fear and stops the body from healing. So let's give an example. You are um, in the midst of a very stressful moment where you're on the phone with somebody who's accusing you of something. You did this. You caused this for me. And your heart's racing. You're feeling confronted. Your animal instincts are kicking in to defend yourself about why you did certain things. Your body's feeling this adrenaline rush. And then a couple days later, the issue's resolved. Somebody says, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that to you. Or it, you come down from the high of being accused of something and you get sick. You get a cold or you get a flu or you're, you're all of a sudden you're coming down with something. This is known as conflict and resolution. Okay? You were under conflict, so you went into fight or flight. So your body at that point in time wasn't going to experience any symptoms other than go, 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 deal with this, heart racing, adrenaline pumping. But when you came down from it, then your body's like, I need to heal from all of that junk stress hormones that were pumped through my system. 
So I'm going to take the time to elicit mucus and all these byproducts that get rid of the sludge in my system. Okay, so it's actually a good thing, but we don't feel like it's a good thing. Same thing happens with people that like train for a marathon. For that, you know, 12 months they're training, man, their adrenaline's going, their cortisol's pumping, they're running miles, everything feels great. They do the marathon, the relief sets in that they accomplish their goal, and typically they get sick. I have a lot of clients that are athletes that that happens to. Is it wrong or bad? No, it's a healing mechanism, okay? You have the threat, and then you have the resolution, and that's healing. So. The first thing I want you to look at is the fact that sometimes healing actually comes through symptoms. You went through something bad or uncomfortable or scary, and then your body resulted in a healing phase that doesn't feel that comfortable <laughs> to you. Okay, I'll get into some more analogies here in a second. And it manifests in different parts of the body, okay? Now, what happens though in some people is that sometimes we go through a threat and Let's say you're a competitive person and you join CrossFit and you're for months and months and months, you're doing all these lifts every day, an hour workout, killing yourself, sore. You know, I can't, I can't walk five days out of the week because I'm doing legs every day. Feeling great, losing weight, looking good, muscles are building. But then one day you hit a wall and you can't get out of bed. And you have now taxed your body to the point of it's no longer able to release cortisol to get you up in the morning for your workout. And you wonder, what is happening to me? All of a sudden, I can't function. For months and months and months, you're dealing with issues like your hair's falling out, you're putting on weight, you can't have any energy, you're dealing with chronic fatigue, you're constipated, and all of a sudden you get thyroid panels and your thyroid's blown out and your adrenals are blown out. And you're like, what happened? How did this happen? I must be just getting older. But this is known as a hanging healing or being stuck in your, in your conflict where the conflict is not getting resolved. And this ongoing issue becomes something that we seek out all these treatments for. Now I need this diet. Now I need to follow this protocol. Now I'm meeting with this functional practitioner. And yet nothing ever gets resolved because what are we doing? We're stopping the healing by all these different attacks of different modalities and fasting and intermittent this and intermittent that. And that's not what our body needed, okay? What we needed is to go back and resolve the conflict of why did I feel like I had to be in competition? Why did I feel like I had to kill myself every day? What if I actually told my body to go into a hypothyroid state because I was putting pressure on my thyroid to overperform and at one point in time it drops down and I no longer can perform anymore because my body is telling me to slow down, okay? And this happens to a lot of people, but they don't recognize it at that. In mainstream, they're told, oh, you have this autoimmune issue of hypothyroidism, and now, that you, now you need to do this. You need to take thyroid medication. That's going to resolve everything. But it doesn't, because how many people go on that, and they're like, I don't see any results, okay? We're treating symptoms. We're not going to the root of the problem. And sometimes we need to look at the emotional component of things and the stress around why something started and the conflict rather than just another thing where you need to change what you're eating, okay? And this coming from a nutritionist, believe me, I believe in changing certain things about someone's nutrition to support the body. But if we don't go to the root of why the issue developed in the first place, we're gonna be spinning our wheels. So, when we identify what's actually going on under the hood, the body and the mind begin to heal, okay? All thanks to the gut-brain connection. Do you have health symptoms? or a challenge that you love to clear out, then you're gonna look no further than these three things to keep in mind. And then I'm gonna have some tips for you later. But first you need to understand some things. Number one is understand how the gut-brain connection works. And I did a whole class on this that you guys can go back and listen to, but I'm gonna break it down a little more here. Your gut is your second brain. I kind of think of it as even your first brain because it's like all information comes in and then is transmitted also to the brain, so they kind of work in tandem. Your gut is also responsible for your immune system, your metabolism, your hormones, your digestion, your energy. All of this determines your symptoms or diseases that you get or don't get, okay? Hence, you can imagine what happens to your health when your brain interprets stress, okay? The brain sends signals down the gut-brain axis to the five million brain cells inside your gut. Yeah, you actually have cells that transmit to your gut that show how symptoms show up in your entire body. If you've ever had butterflies in your stomach, boom, gut-brain connection, okay? 
The interesting thing about stress is that your gut and your brain cannot tell the difference it, like in eating a cheeseburger every day for lunch versus running from a bear, okay? Nutritional stress is still stress. Running from a bear, obviously still stress. Something like believing every day, I'm not good enough. I can't do this job. I'm, I'm not smart enough. Um, this, this can stem into stress, constant stress in the body. I'll never lose the weight. I will always be sick. This transmits in the body. If you've ever told yourself, if I eat that, I'll gain five pounds instantly. And then you do. That's because your gut brain connection is so powerful and your brain believes the thoughts that you're putting out. And this isn't just woo woo stuff. This is science. Okay. The body sees all sources of stress as the same. Anytime you think a stressful thought, you're releasing cortisol. Cortisol makes you put on water weight. There's the five pounds you gained just by thinking that it was going to affect your body. Okay. In fact, CT scans actually show that people with different health conditions like diabetes or cold and a flu, IBS, anxiety, have inflammation in specific parts of their brain correlated with specific organs, tissues, and symptoms, okay? The brain is mapped for over 500 symptoms and conditions related to gut-brain connection. So after a stressor has occurred and passed is when symptoms show up. So this is something I ask my clients a lot in a, cl in a s consultation. I'll say, you mentioned that you have trouble sleeping. Can you tell me what happened just before that started? And it's interesting because there's always something. Just before the symptoms of not being able to sleep or having digestive issues or chronic migraines, it always was something. And in a lot of cases, it was, you know, they lost somebody or they had a divorce or they lost a job or something significant in their life was a conflict that then led into the symptoms, okay? So if we don't go back and address the conflict, then the symptoms are ongoing and you're in what's called a hanging healing or a hanging conflict that won't resolve. So all the melatonin in the world and all of the valerian roots and all of the, you know, have some warm milk before bed, those are great to support the body, but you're not going to resolve the symptoms unless you go to the conflict that started it in the first place because the body is still on high alert from that conflict. It hasn't been resolved. So the stress hormones are still coming out and affecting us, okay? Different symptoms in the body are related to how we are doing life and what experiences, conflicts, and traumas are affecting us. Symptoms are often a metaphor of what's subconsciously going on inside the gut-brain connection. So, and they can be a good thing. Symptoms are actually a message from your body that conflict has happened and needs to be resolved. So whatever the symptom is, now you want to go back and you want to go, you want to understand that gut-brain connection. That's my understanding tip number one, is that what happened just prior to the symptoms? I'll give you an example, it, speaking of insomnia. So when my dad passed away, he died in his sleep on a couch. And it's interesting because for years I had insomnia, I had trouble sleeping, and it wasn't until I started sleeping on a couch <laughs> and not a bed, that I started sleeping well. And the reason was, in my subconscious, I was connecting with the loss of my father by sleeping on that couch, okay? And I had to tell myself, I'm not, I don't need a couch to connect with him. He's, he's at rest, I can be at rest, I'm safe, he's safe, everything is good now. And that thought helped resolve my sleep quite a bit and going to the the root cause not all the you know I still take melatonin from time to time or I still take things just to wind down or whatever and use my blue light blockers take my magnesium to give myself the make sure I'm not running out of magnesium all those are supportive of the body but in order to really get past my insomnia I had to understand that that conflict that my body was feeling of I need to be connected to him no you don't it's okay. You're connected to those people you love no matter wh where you're sleeping, okay? So I had to tell my brain I'm safe, and that's a lot of what working on symptoms is doing. When we don't feel safe, we're under that same conflict or threat all the time, and we have to get past that feeling of unsafety and remind the brain and the gut we're safe. There's no issue here. There's no more threat. And even if it starts as something as, here's a little tip of starting to tell yourself, I'm safe. My environment is safe, my choices are safe, this is what I'm doing to keep myself safe.
then that starts to calm the body and calm those chronic stress hormones that are causing the issue or whatever it is, okay? So let's go through some symptoms that you might be feeling that actually can help you identify and understand what your body is dealing with on a conflict level, meaning that this we're gonna break down some symptoms and then some conflicts that could be causing it so that you can see, hey, that's right. I did start having gut issues after um, somebody told me, you know, that my, I wasn't measuring up at my job or whatever it was. Okay, let me let me spell that out for you. So, food intolerances, bloating, constipation, digestive issues stem from what's called an indigestible or undigestible conflict in the brainstem region. Basically, you you had something that was told to you or done to you that you couldn't digest, like maybe you lost someone and you're stuck in that phase of, I can't believe they're gone. I haven't learned to accept that that person is gone and you weren't able to digest it. So since the time that they had passed on, you then became gassy, bloated, uncomfortable. You were diagnosed with IBS or Crohn's or colitis or whatever, because you figuratively couldn't digest your food based on the feeling of the emotional undigestion, that gut brain connection. Okay. So this is something that, you know, we get hunger around something that we figuratively can't digest, swallow, eliminate, that shows up in our digestive organs. Like the, even the metaphor of like, that's hard to swallow. You know, some news that you get is hard to swallow. A lot of people dige uh, got digestive issues during the pandemic because it was hard to swallow that the world had become as uncomfortable or scary as it was. So I saw a lot of clients coming to me on Zoom going, man, my gut's all messed up. Is it something you know I'm doing? Am I getting too sterile from all the hand sanitizer? I'm sure that's a part of it because we need good gut microbiomes, but it also is, let's go back to when that developed. And a lot of them would say, I was really scared and anxious and nervous when this pandemic started and I was so scared I was gonna get sick. There you go. It was hard to swallow. It was hard to digest that we lived in a world that was that scary, okay? So once we look at it from that level, then we can go, oh, okay, now I just need to understand that it's okay, I'm not in that threat anymore, and I can calm down and my gut can calm down. Same thing with bloating. I have a lot of people that come to me, oh, I'm bloated all the time, I don't understand why, and I'll ask, what's going on in your life? Oh, I'm so busy, I'm so stressed, I have this, that, and the other, and I, you know, I have trouble saying no. Their life's actually bloated, and so their gut will be bloated as well, because what we do in life actually can manifest in our body and that's the message our body is sending us. Tink, 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 I'm not okay. Like the choices that you're making are not supporting me nutritionally or emotionally or mentally or whatever it is. Okay, so then we have to look at, let's dial back. Let's pull some irons out of the fire. Let's learn to relax a couple days a week and see if your bloating gets better. Nine times out of 10, it does. Now, acne, skin issues, rashes, um, just any sort of dermatitis or skin issues, these are known as an attack conflict. Skin issues can also be a boundary conflict. Somebody has um, had some separation and now they're, they're missing someone that they're separated from or they're having issues where they want to separate from someone who's toxic in their life. Our skin is our separation from the world and our skin is what keeps us from internally being attacked. So acne can actually be manifested, a lot of times we see it in teenagers because teenagers go through a phase where they feel like they're being attacked from their friends, like putting pressure on them, their parents putting pressure on them, so they develop acne. And yeah, a lot of people go, oh, it's the pizza they're eating or the fried foods or whatever, but really their body is reacting in a um, mechanism of safety to protect them in the form of acne. So it's releasing these oils to protect the skin which results in the acne developing on their face. Same thing with rashes or eczema or psoriasis. Now you're looking at a separation issue. The skin is being separated and getting thicker or forming flakes or mounds or um, developing like this raised inflamed area because there's an issue with separation. Maybe a child or a teenager went through a divorce and they feel like they're being pulled from you know the parent side and the the dad, the mom and the dad, they want to be with one, but they want to be with the other, you know, so there's this separation conflict. Or it could be the parent. Every time the child has to go to the other parent's house, they develop this itchy rash. 
and it's really the body manifesting, I'm not okay, I'm under threat, I'm under conflict because I need that person in my life, I don't want to be separated from them. So this is so interesting because it doesn't mean that you have to go use proactive or what all <laughs> whatever these acne creams are. In fact, you don't want to do that. You don't want to disturb the skin microbiome. You want to understand that there's something going on, you're feeling attacked. Where are you feeling attacked? How can you resolve the attack and feel okay, feel like you're no longer under threat, and then the skin calms down. So then we have all the issue of autoimmunity. There's a lot of people dealing with autoimmunity. In fact, I did a whole class on that. Often stems from a gut hunger for self-worth. The immune system degrades its own tissue, just like we degrade ourselves with thoughts like, I'm not good enough highlighted by inflammation in your frontal lobe, the brain region connect, connected to negative self-talk. So isn't that interesting? So you can actually feel degraded and then your body manifests this issue of degrading its own tissue. And so in that case, what would you do? You would go to the negative self-talk and go, why do I feel this way? Is this my voice? Did somebody tell me that I wasn't good enough? Because if I actually dissect the voices that I'm hearing, was it my mother's voice? Was it my father's voice? Was it you know, some, a boss I worked for that told me I wasn't good enough. How do I feel about myself? Do I feel like I'm putting my best foot forward? Then yeah, I do have worth and I need to start valuing myself, okay? Speaking of that, back pain, joint pain, inflammation of the joints or tissue or muscle can be self-devaluation, okay? You're not valuing your body and it represents in a stressful or difficult burden we've been trying to carry, okay? And so we feel like we're always under the weight of, of somebody else who didn't value us and they, they or we devalued ourselves based on a situation. I heard about a gal that um, went through a choking instance and she felt like that was so silly. Why didn't I just chew my food? I'm such an idiot. And she devalued herself. And she started to have this chronic jaw, uh, jaw pain around where you know around her neck it went down into her neck just like the choking thing had occurred and it wasn't until she talked to somebody else who had also had a choking experience and this was a highfalutin really successful guy who had his life together and she realized well if he was if it's simple enough for a guy like him to choke then maybe i'm not an idiot and the symptom resolved all of her pain went away so it's interesting that when we look at like why did this spot on my back that just started to hurt manifest you know what happened just before then what conflict might you have gone through that led to you feeling devalued and carrying the weight of a stressful burden constipation going back to gut issues often related to also an indigestible conflict something we feel stuck in or can't eliminate perhaps you have someone in your life that you need to be a caregiver for but that person is very difficult and it's hard for you to digest that this is your life taking care of them Okay, constipation can be a lot of other things. It can be a magnesium deficiency. It can be a thyroid issue. But again, we go back to why the magnesium deficiency? Why the thyroid issue? What happened just before that, okay? And we've all felt heartbroken or had gut reactions that we had to get something off our chest. So s things like heart issues, chest pain. What is something that's weighing down on your chest that you haven't addressed and you know it's floating around in the back of your mind but you're not willing to go there? Okay, that can be manifestation in the chest cavity of the weight of the world uh, on, that, on that chest, putting pressure on you, okay? Some sort of pressure. A lot of perfectionists can have heart issues because they put a lot of pressure on themselves. So biological conflicts are usually always linked to the functions of the correlating organ. The organs of the alimentary canal refer to a morsel conflict. Alimentary meaning colon. Morsel meaning like something is a morsel in your life that's not digestible. Not being able to swallow, digest, eliminate a morsel. The uterus, the prostate, this is a procreation conflict. So somebody with a prostate cancer or something with maybe like a uterine cancer could be dealing with the fact that maybe they never were able to procreate or maybe they didn't have the the amount of children they wanted maybe the ones they have are having issues so they're feeling that in their procreation center okay and then the skin like I mentioned to separation conflicts so in unison with the psyche like the inner person that you are 
and the autonomic nervous system, the conflict-related organ responds to physical changes. How we do anything is how we do everything. So if you have trouble digesting life, you're going to have trouble digesting your food because of the stress hormones, because of the stress conflict in your life. And that's, that's kind of, that's what I mean about this being heavy and hard to digest <laughs> right now because we're learning about things that have nothing to do with, you know, eat gluten-free or go on a keto paleo approach, you know, or go carnivore. Like that's not the recipe, that's treating the symptom. You need to go to the why of why did this manifest in the first place? Why do I have gut issues that need to be resolved with going carnivore, okay? And that's where it's a little bit digger, uh, deeper of a dig, but when you do, you've resolved it. You can eat what it is that you're naturally prone to or intuitively wanting to eat rather than restricting yourself and doing this vicious cycle of stress, okay? So with long-lasting conflict activity, such as that hanging conflict I mentioned, the continuous cell augmentation can happen. What that means is proliferation of cells can lead to tumors or cancers. A cancer that originates in glandular tissue, such as breast glands, and a, a tumor that's secretory quality, like the organs of the colon, like a colon cancer, is usually called like an adenocarcinoma, so adding to the body or proliferating cells. And so this is a hanging conflict. Your body is developing this, this conflict activity in the body with continuous cell proliferation, okay? And that's, that's not something w that we want. However, the tumor can actually be a good thing. That's a whole other class sometime that if you want to dig deeper with me, we'll get into because your body has a way of building tumors in order to encapsulate something that's a conflict so that it doesn't affect you. Some people can't buy into that because they see cancer as a bad word. And I'm not going to negate that cancer isn't dangerous or that it's not you know, something that you want to address. But there is a different school of thought out there that is all about we want to work with the body rather than fight against the body, okay? So, bottom line, hanging conflict refers to a situation where a person can remains in that conflict state because the conflict has not been resolved. So I want you to be brainstorming in your mind as you're hearing this. What conflict always kind of rings true in the back of my mind that I haven't really processed. I haven't grieved over it. I haven't cried and said, that wasn't fair. That shouldn't have happened to me. Or I was wrong. I need to go to that person and apologize. Or I wasn't truthful and I've been carrying this issue of not being truthful with somebody for a long time and I need to own up to that. I need to take a step of faith and go tell somebody what I did. Your, your issue is going to be resolved. What if you did that and what if your symptoms got different and actually went away because you resolved where they came from in the first place on an emotional level, okay? Then there's also like food allergens. I mean, some people develop food allergies based on an emotional conflict, not having to do with you just ate cheese one day and you're like, now I'm lactose intolerant, okay? Food allergens such as milk or dairy intolerances causes different symptoms in different people, okay? Some people get mucusy, they get nasally, some people get instant diarrhea when they eat it, uh, runny nose or itchy eyes or cough, like this chronic cough from dairy. So it's, we need to look at the why. What were you doing when there was a conflict? Maybe you were eating a cheese sandwich or you were eating some yogurt whenever you went through something really conflicting. Somebody had a really big argument with you while you were eating macaroni and cheese when you were little. And since then, your body senses, okay, this food, this environment, this substance is a threat to me, okay? As far-fetched as this sounds, we are not allergic to specific foods. We are omnivores. We're supposed to be able to eat all different kinds of things, and we should have a robust system to be able to do that. But if we were in a conflict during the time that we were exposed to some sort of smell, a cleaning agent, a cosmetic, a metal, a mold, a dust mite, um, we were in a dusty environment, we, so we developed dust allergies, we were with a dog whenever we were yelled at and we developed dog allergies. As far-fetched as the sound, our body registers those threats that were in that same environment when the conflict occurred as just as dangerous as the conflict. Okay, We can therefore also be allergic to a certain person, a specific location, 
a smell. You might smell something and all of a sudden you're like, oh, that, that, that gives me allergies. Every, I, have an, uh, I have an aversion to perfumes or an aversion to these certain smells because maybe that person had that on them. And so it, it equates a threat to you, okay? So you just start developing these allergies because of those specific environmental threats, including the food that you could have been eating during that time. All right, enough about that. Now, going a little deeper on the morsel conflict, uh, conflict, hunger is all about not being able to figuratively digest, swallow, or eliminate something in our life, okay? So some examples may include not being able to di digest difficult news, being told you're fat by the popular girl in school and having a tough time swallowing that, struggling to eliminate a bad person in your life because you love that person but you know they're toxic to you so it's very hard it's difficult to swallow it's difficult to digest that that relationship has ended morsel conflicts often show up as gut issues also thyroid issues because the gut affects the thyroid we actually like i've said in other classes t4 goes down to the liver and becomes t3 if the liver's under conflict then we don't make that T3, so the thyroid gets sluggish. Heart issues, weight gain, respiratory issues, eating disorders, food intolerances. Why? Because everything is transmitted from a gut level, okay? All information comes through the gut. Then you have the attack conflict, okay? Somebody attacked you. Maybe you had a parent that was always like on your back about stuff, yelling at you and attacking you exactly like it sounds like feeling like others in the world or others around you in your life were attacking you a knife in the back maybe somebody gossiped about you and you still ruminate on the fact that why did they say that about me to those people being rejected or fear of being rejected because you were rejected by someone who attacked you verbal abuse or physical abuse okay that is being attacked attacked conflicts often show up as skin issues because that's your separation your boundaries and also uh, things like respiratory issues because your body will increase oxygen when it feels like it's under attack. So you can manifest like panic attacks or trouble breathing or every time you get sick, it goes into your lungs, okay? Bodily swelling, bloating and edema and, and even nighttime waking because you're always on that alert of being attacked, okay? Um, migraine headaches are interesting because conflicts linked to migraines are, for example, powerless conflicts, p feeling powerless, security conflicts, or feeling insecure, or feeling like you're always having to protect yourself from someone, okay? Biting remark conflicts, somebody who's, you know, attacking you or having biting remarks. Territorial fear. You don't have a territory because you're in fear of those over you who have taken territory control, okay? Frontal fear fear of an attack on your frontal thinking, like your, your ability to make good decisions and self-care. And recurring migraines are caused by this conflict relapsing, like you're in it, you, you're no longer with that person who is attacking you with the, when the migraines first started, but now you continually find yourself in situations where you are on the alert. And as soon as you feel that attack from that individual, then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, here comes a migraine because I have to shut down. I can't deal with this. And that's pretty much what a migraine is, is it's your body's way of going, I can't feel the threat, I need to shut down. And it feels the pain instead, okay? So there is just some breakdowns of what some symptoms are. Um, you can also talk about that self-devaluation or self-esteem conflict. You're the hardest one on yourself, right? You're the perfectionist. You're constantly comparing yourself or cutting yourself down. You feel like you'll never find uh, the one, maybe. You're, you're, you're single and you're looking for the one, but you're so hard on yourself and you're so hard on your choices about who you would end up with. Feeling left out um, from others. Beating yourself up because you don't feel worthy of friends or things like that. Self-devaluation conflicts often show up as autoimmune diseases, hair and organ loss. So if you're having that hair loss we talked about in one of the classes, it could be because you're devaluing yourself and your body's not prioritizing hair growth, okay? Right now it's going through a stress conflict. Gallbladder issues can actually be self-devaluation and self-esteem too. And musculoskeletal issues and osteoporosis because we're, we're devaluing our body's ability to rebuild and repair. And then territory and separation conflicts, feeling threatened for survival, safety, experiencing 
any sort of frustration from not being heard, experiencing loss or separation, moving to a new city when you were younger, having to change schools all the time. Maybe your partner's not on the same page, you're two different people and you have two different goals and you just don't feel like you're connecting and you're, you're kind of clashing territories. Um, maybe your child's growing up and leaving the nest, so there's that separation conflict. Okay, Separation conflicts also can result in hormonal imbalances, um, infertility for people who haven't had children. Even tumors and cancerous tumors, cysts and adrenal issues can show up in territory. Also the boundary issues of like not setting boundaries or maybe somebody didn't set boundaries for you younger or they stepped over a boundary and they touched you inappropriately or perhaps there's been boundary issues where people have crossed the line with you. These can show up in UTI and interstitial cystitis and bladder issues and kidney issues. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Because the bladder is a, uh, it's a territory and you mark your territory with your pee. And so <laughs> it can be a boundary issue. So it's kind of interesting um, where all these stem from. And if you want to look into this further, there's a, there's a type of um, information you can look up about what I'm talking about, about the conflict issue in your body that manifests into symptoms. And it's called German New Medicine. And so this has been around a long time and it stems from things like it is Chinese medicine, you know, Ayurveda. So it's got, it's got realms of all of that. And I love to study different varieties of medicine that really go to the root of why somebody's struggling, not treating a symptom. Because there's a lot of functional practitioners out there that they're not prescribing pharmaceutical drugs. So you go to these natural doctors and they're like, here, take this supplement, this supplement, here's 65 different supplements that you need to take to treat your symptoms, okay? Which is fine. I'm not saying supplements are bad. I recommend supplements from time to time too. However, you're still treating a symptom because I can give you melatonin to help you sleep, but why aren't you sleeping? Okay, that's what we want to go to. When did the sleeping issue begin? Let's go to that route first. And I do that with people. In the meantime, I might give them melatonin and magnesium, but I'm also going to ask them, when did this start? And what can we do to remedy it in the meantime? How can we move you out of conflict and into resolution? Okay. So remember, symptoms really only show up after the stressor or the conflict has occurred in past. So if you're, after all, if you're running from a bear, the last thing your body wants to do is stop and feel the ankle you just sprained. You don't have time to feel symptoms when you're in the conflict. However, after you've escaped the bear, you look down and now you feel your ankle hurting, okay? And you'll hear it like on Shark Week on Discovery Channel, like if people are hit by a shark, they don't feel the pain until they're on the beach laying, waiting for the ambulance, right? They swam back to shore, they were in the conflict, their body got them through it, but then once the conflict was over, now they feel the pain in their leg, okay? So that's how the body starts the healing process. It's interesting, our symptoms may not be these horrid things that we beat ourselves up about, I'll never fix this, and da 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 They actually can be the beginning stages of healing. So instead of treating the symptom, we want to support the body as it starts to heal. And in the meantime, we want to go, why did this manifest so that it doesn't continue to be a hanging conflict? Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so tips to become your own healer here because you know your body better than anybody and you need to be the one that starts to work on this rather than spending seven minutes with your physician. Not to say that's wrong or bad, but they don't know you like you know you, okay? So disclaimer, I make no claims here to treat, cure, or heal because frankly, your mind and your body are the only options to, heal, to help heal yourself. Only you can heal you, nobody else can. So. Number one is awareness, okay? Anything, with anything in life, we have to become aware of why, what is going on that I need to address. So do a little bit of reflecting and journaling and digging. Here's some questions. What are my symptoms trying to tell me? What conflicts or stressors have I, have I been going through or have been ongoing and I've not resolved them yet lately, okay? Or when did the symptoms start? What happened just before then? Just like I asked my clients, okay? Here's another personal example because many of you have known that I went through a toxic mold exposure. And this is what I divulged from it as the years have gone by because this was like eight years ago. If you've ever lived in a college dorm or a home older than 10 years or moved homes a few times in your life, we've all been exposed to mold. At least one out of two homes nationwide have some sort of mold contamination. There is no escaping it because water gets in houses, bottom line. 
water is in houses. I mean, we have showers, faucets, toilets, all of this thing. That said, what separates one person from getting super sick like I did while living in mold and another person like my husband didn't show up with any symptoms at all? So why did I grow up in a whole home that I know had mold because my mom had dehumidifiers all over our basement and yet I didn't get affected until I was like 35 years old, okay? Here's why I got affected at 35 years old. I was sleeping four or five hours on most nights. I started my own business. I had a baby and a family to care for. I was working nonstop and traveling nonstop for the other business that I worked for. I was working out three to four hours a day. I previously had lost family members and had been infertile for seven years. <laughs> so you do the math. Was it the mold that got me or was it the conflict, the stressors that I'd put on my life that put me in a state of stress where my body was able to be affected by the mold. This is where the gut-brain connection comes into place in the perfect storm of other significant stressors in your life that the brain then associates with mold. So all of these things culminated while living in this moldy environment and then my body's like, it's the house that you're in. It's this, you've got to get out of that. And during that time, um, boy, was life stressful. So if I had addressed that, I probably wouldn't have manifested the symptoms that I was. So here's another example that you might resonate with when it comes to cravings for certain foods as symptoms. Sometimes gut hungers can manifest not only as health symptoms, but in our food as well. Life feels chaotic, for example. There's nothing like eating the same things every day or on the flip side, eating an entire batch of cookies for a sense of calm and control. Okay, so when you feel chaotic, some people are like, I need routine, I need structure. Other people are like, I'm in chaos, I don't want to think about it, I want to shut my mind off and eat a bunch of cookies. Okay? On the flip side, if life feels out of control, our need for certainty may lead to obsession over calories, to where we start, I have to control something, I can't control all this over here, so I'm going to control my body, and I'm going to become super obsessive and hyper hyper orthorexic they call it where I'm dialing everything in and I can't have a morsel of gluten and I can't do anything outside my workouts and everything has to be in my control okay what about if we're bored and we're needing variety in our job or relationship we may seek that spicy Thai meal or the pizza party with ourselves or struggling with making commitments of any sort because we're, we're we don't want to make a commitment we need variety or life is uncomfortable. Take the pandemic, for example. No wonder you craved comfort foods like ice cream and pizza during the pandemic to find grounding, to find pleasure, to find comfort during a time of uncertainty or uncomfortableness, okay? So the food side of things, restrictive eating is often an identity conflict for many, a lack of self-worth. For others, it's a lack of love. Restriction and self-denial eases the pain. Maybe we were restricted about things about when we were children and that connects us to our parents that restriction that self-denial we connect with that because that's what we grew up with stuffing your face followed by purging like some sort of binge eating disorder can be a lack of control you feel stuffed and to release the overwhelm the purge happens okay binge eating is often due to a lack of love and connection so we find that the food is always there on a similar note, chocolate cravings have a signal for a need for love and connection. Crunchy and salty foods can uh, represent unexpressed anger. We just crunch and we can deal with some of that frustration in our head, okay? So the, the, we numb out the feelings with that constant crunch. Uh, then maybe you're really dialed into, I am so vegan, I'm so raw vegan, and I'm with this raw vegan community or I'm with this keto community, you may be seeking identity or a sense of purpose in other areas. So what are you hungry for? <laughs> Alright, so number two, a tip to help you is experiment. So first you're going to get that awareness. That's tip number one. Ask yourself, what happened just prior to the symptoms? What am I hungry for? What's going on in my life that feels out of control? Okay, number two is experiment to resolve the conflict trying to find a practical solution is therefore the best as it's most lasting so a loss of a job for example could be dealt with by picking up an old hobby okay so i can't do this so now what would i do that would bring me joy since i can't do the job that i love okay um territorial anger like you're having a territory issue, you're having bladder issues, you're having chronic UTIs. Maybe that you need to move. Maybe you're feeling territorial anger with your community. You don't feel like you're 
uh, your territory is safe, so it may require a move. Now that's pretty drastic, so that might be something that happens later. Maybe you want to resolve the issue with the neighbor first and give them the benefit of the doubt. Solving a problem such as telling someone they hurt you, saying I so I'm sorry to someone you've hurt, or grieving the loss that you haven't grieved yet by just crying and saying it wasn't fair to lose that person I loved. Sometimes conflicts resolve themselves. For instance, when life circumstances change, or when other matters gain more priority, or maybe somebody comes to you and says they're sorry, all of a sudden the conflict resolves and you don't have the symptoms anymore, okay? On a spiritual level, conflicts we're facing are an invitation to reconsider our attitude, pray, let go of the anger, uh, crying therapy, talk therapy, trying to see the larger picture, understanding the position of people involved, looking from where, what their background was, why they hurt you in the first place, and to practice forgiveness and loving kindness as a true source of healing. So those can all be ways to experiment to resolve the conflict, okay? Now number three, notice and be gentle with yourself and self-care. With the resolution of a conflict, the autonomic nervous system switches into this, what they call lasting vagatonia, or the vagus nerve stimulates and calms you down, okay? In this prolonged state, of rest, which can result in fatigue. It can result in needing to wind down and rest from that chronic fight or flight that you are in. So what I'm saying is sometimes when you resolve a conflict, you're going to have different symptoms or the symptoms may get worse before they get better because you're in a resolution phase and it's time for your body to calm down. So let the healing happen. Allow for rest and maybe you're going to have an appetite, so eat, the, eat foods that nourish your body. This is the time when we want to dial in our nutrition, maybe take some supplements that help your body heal, okay? So that's where it's, it's important to support the body with self-care rather than rely on those supplements as the way to heal, okay? That's not the healing, that's the support. It's a supplement to your healing, okay? If the healing phase is intense, the tiredness, the chronic fatigue could be so overwhelming that you can hardly get out of bed. That's when you want to really support the adrenals, but also allow for that rest. The need for sleep is particularly strong during the day if somebody has chronic fatigue. And that onset of tiredness um, as diagnosed generally as, gen as chronic fatigue can happen. And so it's not going to be like that forever. You've got to allow for the rest, and then as soon as the resolution has occurred in the body, you're going to get back to normal. Um, low pulse rate or a slow pulse, low blood pressure, this is all coming down. Maybe you're going to start to feel your hands get warmer. That's a good indication that you're healing if you've been cold for a long time or your temperature increases. Those are good indications that you're moving in the right direction. So while you might see some symptoms pop up when you're healing, you also might see some resolutions that keep you moving in the right direction. Okay, it may not feel like you're healing and certain nutritional helpers can be a good adjunct, like I said. So that's when working with a coach can be really important here. Now also, you wanna identify, this is number four, you wanna identify some beliefs that you have about your symptoms. Because if you have these ruminating thoughts like, I'm never gonna get well, I'm always gonna be sick, this weight is never gonna budge, I'm never gonna go to sleep, your body resonates with that, okay? If I eat this food, I'm gonna get sick. Stop saying that. <laughs> like, our words are power, okay? The, the power that we have in our thoughts and our words affect our body. So after you identify, first you wanna identify the beliefs. Write them down in your journal if you have to. I believe that I'm never gonna heal. I believe that I'm sick all the time. I believe that I'm irritable and negative and I don't know what to do about it, okay? Write those down, be brutally honest with yourself. Then, after you identify those, tailor the work to your symptoms, meaning go back to just before the symptoms occur, like I said, and see what the conflict was. Did somebody tell you that you're never gonna own up to what you should be, you're never gonna be good enough, do you never do anything right, okay? Notice what voice are you hearing when you hear you're fat or you're stupid or you don't measure up. Whose voice is that? Because I can almost guarantee you it's not yours. It's somebody else said something to you that made you feel the way you do. But if you wipe all that away and you say, what do I think about myself? Apart from everybody else's opinion, what do I think? Was I always doing my very best? Was I trying? Was I doing what I knew to do was right at the time, 
then give yourself the benefit of the doubt and go, I am okay, I am good enough, I can do this, this next thing I try might work, okay? So we want to go back to just before and note, I want you to identify the voice that you're hearing. Now, not the like, the voice is in your head, okay? I'm really talking about somebody at some point in your life said something to you that formed a belief, whether it was a parent, a teacher, a sibling, a friend at school, or a bully. Somebody formed a belief in your mind about yourself, and you need to identify whose voice that is because that's not your voice, okay? All right, so after you identify that, then that's when you want to develop the opposite of that belief. I can heal, okay? I can eat certain foods. I feel safe when I do these habits that make me feel good. I'm going to focus on the things that make me feel safe. We have to look at things in your environment that are making you feel unsafe and fix those so that your belief can be, I'm in an environment that is conducive for me to heal. I'm doing habits such as eating gluten-free that are conducive to lower my, you know, let's say you have a Hashimoto's and you need to lower your TPO antibodies. I'm doing that. I'm making time for rest and relaxation. I'm treating my body with respect. I'm doing all these things in order to heal. So this is my new belief is I believe I can do this because I'm setting up the proper conditions to do so, okay? Change your limiting beliefs to truths about what is actually in your control to speed your healing and go to the root of the issue. And it's pretty much the opposite of whatever your limiting beliefs are. You're gonna say the opposite of that, okay? Change your thoughts to change your brain, okay? One more tip is for those of you that have, all of us have been affected by our parents in some way, right? Our parents were just doing what they need to do. Their parents were just doing what they need to do, knew to do. And we've all screwed up as parents. Our parents screwed us up. It's, it's out there, you know? We've all done talk therapy about what our parents did to us. It's cool, man. We're imperfect people. We do the best we can with our kids and that's all we can do, okay? But many of our conflicts are because our beliefs, like a parent, was someone who ensued these fears in us, these negative patterns of thinking, this self-devaluation. If you were abused, you might have boundary issues, or if you have too strict of parents, or maybe you had parents that didn't set boundaries for you when they were peer parents, you can do whatever you want. Now you feel out of control because you, you haven't set any boundaries for yourself, okay? All of these are things that we can start to reparent ourselves. Start to talk to yourself like you would want your parent to talk to you. You need to turn off your devices at eight o'clock because that's best for your health, right? What would you do as a really loving parent for your child? What would you do as a morning routine to make sure your day went the best way possible? What would you do to calm yourself down when you're in a stress conflict? That's how you wanna to talk to yourself on this level of limiting beliefs so that you can start to separate from those other beliefs that were patterned in you, okay? It's kinda of like a computer. Okay? If it's always running the same programming and it gets a bug, then that program gets screwed up and the computer doesn't run as fast. So if we go and reprogram the computer and we take it to our computer guy and he reprograms everything and it works, it functions, now it's running a new program. It's running, you know, Safari, Snow Leopard, Max 10.0 or whatever it is. That runs everything better and we start to live happier and healthier. And so that's what you wanna do is reprogram the way that somebody talked to you. Start talking to yourself the way you would have liked that person to talk to you. And this can start manifesting that healing issue in the body. So that's all, that's huge. You guys are like, going through all kinds of situations in your head right now. What was the conflict? What did I go through? What did somebody say to me? And that's where I want you to be right now, identifying and becoming aware. That's the first step. Then you're gonna start to implement these little steps along the way as you learn this. Maybe you go back and listen to this, but this is powerful stuff because I could give you this protocol and that supplement to treat your symptom just like a pharmaceutical drug does. But until you go to the root of the why, and you start to understand the conflict and you understand the resolution, that's when you're gonna to start to heal, okay? That's all I got for now. Thanks for listening. And
trouble sleeping, gut issues? Do you know your thyroid is off, but your doctor won't do anything about it? Symptoms don't lie. If you feel like you don't feel good, then something is off. Listen to that inner knowing and reach out. That's what I'm here for, to help guide you towards what's going on at the root of your issues and get them resolved. Bring back your vitality, your energy, your happiness, and get that body you've always wanted with nutrition and lifestyle therapy. I approach it from a very bio individual way and each consult is unique to you where I get to know you and what your body needs rates are affordable with different options depending on what you need and what you can afford no two people are alike and none of their lifestyles are alike so I don't approach any consultation the same as another you are as unique as your fingerprint so let's get to the bottom of what your body needs and get you looking and feeling as awesome as I know you are to get started with a free 15 minute discovery call email me at getfitwithjodel at gmail.com. That's G-E-T-F-I-T with Jodell, J-O-D-E-L-L-E at gmail.com. Well, it's not raindrops on roses, but these are a few of my favorite things that I always notice a difference in my health when I stick to these healthy habits. So number one is watching the sunrise or some sort of red light exposure every single day. Number two is grounding and earthing daily. And sometimes I combine watching the sunrise while swimming in my local lake. First thing in the morning as the sun comes up, I'm grounded. I'm earthed right into this natural body of water. Number three is C60. I've been using a supplement called C60 Purple Power for over three years now with great results. I don't intend to stop. I use it for a variety of reasons. And number four, as most of you know, I am a professional paddleboard athlete. So paddleboarding is always part of my weekly regimen of keeping my mind fresh, getting my vitamin P, and keeping my body in a really great healthy state with lots of active relaxation and that form of movement that uses up your entire body. Now I'm going to have a link to a few of the things that make these habits more efficient, more affordable, and effective for me in the show notes of this podcast that I personally use and recommend daily to my clients. The first one is going to be, if you can't get some sort of sunlight exposure, then consider a red light device, which I love Sauna Space, and I'm going to have a link where you get a 5% discount in saunaspace.com in the show notes here, so check that out. Also, If you need to get grounded, but you're working at a computer all day in an office on the fourth floor, I get it. Let's get a grounding mat underneath your feet so while you're getting all that EMF exposure, it's actually just getting right out of your body and you're getting grounded throughout the day. So I'm going to have a link to Ultimate Longevity where you can get a simple universal mat to put right underneath your feet. And I'm going to have a link to C60 Purple Power where you can save 10% on this supplement that can be used from anything to more energy, to better hair and skin, to also helping with blisters and bruises and scrapes and even zits. Yes, you can use it even as mouthwash. So there's so much you can do with this. And for paddleboarding, I'm going to recommend Glide SUP, Glide SUP, Stand Up Paddle Boards, because they come in inflatable as well as rigid hardboards, and they are by far the best boards I've used as of recent years to make sure that I'm getting a quality board that gets me out on the water and I don't have to worry about it having any issues. So that's GlideSUP.com, and you can get 10% off using my code that will be in the show notes. So I hope you get to use some of my favorite things, but also reach out and tell me about them. Tell me about what you like about these products too. Get fit with Jodell at gmail.com.